The Trinity is the source of our grace, divine inhabitation, and the call to the perfection of the image of God. In the beginning was the Holy Trinity, and the Holy Trinity has created the visible and invisible world, the world of human beings and the world of angels, in order to share God's divine nature with us, to grant us a share in God's own contemplative life by grace. We are not only contemplative creatures according to our intellectual natures, we are also called by grace to participate in the divine nature of God himself, a nature that is Trinitarian, the Eternal Father, in knowing and loving himself from all eternity, incomprehensibly begets the word and wisdom of the Son, eternally begotten from him, to whom he communicates the plenitude of the divine nature as God from God and light from light, so that all that is in the Father is in the Son and all that is in the Son is in the Father as the one God. And the Father likewise from all eternity in loving himself loves the word he begets. And with the word and through the word, he spirates or breathes forth immaterial love. The Holy Spirit thus is a fire of immaterial love who is common to the Father and the Son, the love that is the Holy Spirit is the mutual love of the Father for the Son and of the Son for the Father, in whom is contained the plenitude of the divine essence. So that the Spirit too is a person who is the one God, even as he is the subsistent love of the Father and the Son. This is the mysterious Trinitarian life that God has in himself that he wishes to share with us and that remains naturally inaccessible and unknown to us unless God reveals himself to us and communicates to us a means to participate in his divine nature. That means of participation is principally the incarnation and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For now, however, we can consider the Trinity as a principle and source of grace, and the Trinity is the final end of contemplative union. Grace is given to us from the Trinity and for communion with the Trinity. What does it mean to say this? When Thomas Aquinas considers the mystery of grace in its essence, he makes creative use of the four Aristotelian causes in order to think about this topic. Essentially, he notes, grace is something created. When we are in a state of grace, we are given something by God that can be or not be present in us, that we can gain or lose. And this must be something other than God himself, even if it leads us into deeper communion with God. What then is grace, essentially, if we consider it in terms of its formal cause? It is a mysterious dimension of our being that is created by God and communicated to our human person as an addition to our human nature, but also in complement to our nature. Grace does not diminish or do violence to our nature, but instead works to heal and elevate our human nature so that we can be more ourselves in the natural order and can go beyond ourselves into the life of God in the supernatural order. Aquinas argues that created grace in the soul is a quality infused into the essence of the soul that places the whole person in a state of well-being, similar to health in the physical body. Just as a human person can be physically healthy in the whole of his body, so the life of grace places the soul in a global state or habitus of spiritual health. This is why Aquinas calls such grace an essential habitus, or a habit of being, that affects us in all that we are essentially as persons. In effect, grace is a supernatural life of spiritual health that grows within us and flourishes in the spiritual powers of the soul, the intellect, and the will, through the medium of the spiritual virtues and gifts that flow out from the root of grace in the essence of the soul. Concretely, if we ask what grace is in our human lives in this world, what it looks like in act, the answer pertains principally to the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, 
And second, and in alignment with the theological virtues, the infused moral virtues of Christian prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance placed in the service of faith, hope, and love. It also implies, thirdly, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, dispositions in us in virtue of our baptism that allow us to be moved in special ways by the Spirit so as to be more deeply conformed to Christ's life within us. All of this, the infused theological virtues, the infused moral virtues, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit originate from within the wellspring of a soul that is in a state of grace. One can think here of a spring of mountain water coming forth from a source, or a multitude of fruits that grow slowly from one tree or vine. If we pose the question, where does grace come from, the question of the efficient cause or origin, the answer is clearly God himself. It is the Holy Trinity, intimately present at the heart of all things, present in the spiritual soul of each person as creator, who is the author of our grace. Here we should recall the doctrine of divine omnipresence. God as creator is always already present in all things as the actual origin of their being, the one who gives them existence in all that they are. As creator, God is more interior to us than we are to ourselves, whether we are aware of it or not, and whether we are in a state of grace or not. What is new in the mystery of grace is that the God who is already present in the inner core and heart of our being, hidden from us, now makes himself known without doing any violence to our person, by liberating us, by giving us to know him personally. Aquinas notes that there is a new presence of God made available to spiritual creatures, that is to say angels and human beings, in virtue of the communication of grace, so that we can know God not merely as the omnipresent creator, but also in a new way, through friendship with God, in spiritual communion with the Holy Trinity, who is unveiled to our mind and heart in faith, hope, and love. This leads us to the question of the final cause. What is grace for, or what are the effects of grace? Here we can note that the, that the ultimate purpose of grace is to lead us into communion directly with God himself. God gives us created grace so that we can be elevated to live in communion with God in himself, his divine life. This is true already in this world in virtue of the theological virtues. Faith, Aquinas notes at the beginning of the Secunda Secunde, places us immediately in contact with God himself, the first truth. By faith we know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit personally, directly, however obscure this knowledge may be. Faith is already then a conduit of mystical friendship with God and a call to conformity to God's own life springing up within us. In the darkness of faith, we each live something like the prophet Elijah in the famous passage of 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13, in which we see Elijah seeking God, taking refuge in a cave on Mount Sinai, a symbol of the renewal of the covenant at its core. He is taking refuge from an exterior storm of this world, but he hears the whisper of God speaking within. Faith places us in this immediate context with God hidden in darkness, unveiling himself to us, even within us. By hope, we possess God's eternal life, even now, since hope is a movement of the will that tends towards God's eternal life as a final end of decision and rest. We hope in eternal life in the possession of God. We can live eternal life already now in hope, placing our final end in God and in perfect union with the Holy Trinity. Accordingly, by charity, we love God in himself and are united supernaturally with the persons of the Holy Trinity. We learn to love Christ, to serve him, and to do the will of his Father, to be docile to his Holy Spirit, who he gives us to dwell within us. 
Charity, Aquinas notes, is a source of friendship with God. Secunda Secunde, question three, article one. Charity is a friendship with God. It creates a living, common life or a shared life with God in the obscurity of faith and in the simple poverty of supernatural hope. We can speak then of grace as something within us that comes from the Trinity and that leads us into the life of the Trinity. This is why Pope Leo XIII and others in the modern era speak of grace effectuating in us a divine indwelling. Christ speaks of this indwelling in John 14, 23. If a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home in him. If we make our home in a place, we can be said to dwell there. So too God makes his home in us, and this inhabitation or divine indwelling is made possible by the life of grace within us. God can make his home in our souls and dwell there in radiance and light, in love for us and in the love we have for others. In the saints, St. Martin de Porres, God dwells as a sunlight that comes to inhabit the soul, filling the soul with the light of wisdom and knowledge and warming it with the rays of hope and love so that others are in turn warmed by the love of God within the soul and enlightened by God's presence within the soul. In the friends of God, God dwells, and he makes himself known as their father, inspiring hope in them in all things, lifting them up into the light and wisdom of the sun, making them sun-like, sun-conformed, moving them inwardly by the fire of the love of the Holy Spirit, making them supple and burn, burns and burning with the light of the Holy Spirit and his love. They become Christ-like as those who receive and study the truth of God, and they become more virtuous and loving in accord with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, gentle and strong, spiritually generous and flexible, but principled and alive, active but recollected, moved inwardly by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, so as to become more and more spiritually free. So now let me turn in light of this first idea of the Trinitarian origin and end of grace to a second idea of the Christ-conforming orientation of grace, grace as Christo-conforming. Grace is received from Christ, both insofar as he is God and insofar as he is human, as God, our Lord is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And as we have said, it is the Trinity that is the font of all grace, giving life to the soul from within, where God is already present to us in our, as our transcendent and incomprehensible creator. The Trinity is the author of created grace and infuses it, infuses it into the soul so as to elevate the human person raising him or her into the sphere of the Trinity, into friendship and life with God. However, one of the Trinity is human. The eternal word and son has become human and remained forever human in both body and soul in the glory of his resurrection and glorification. As man, Christ has a human soul inundated with created grace. And indeed, his grace, as St. Paul tells us, is capital. He is the head of the church, which is his body. Christ is the head and we are the members. This metaphor of the head and members, as St. Augustine notes, is one that indicates the unidirectionality of all lines of grace. All grace flows out from God through and from the humanity of Christ as the grace that Christ himself has received as in his human individual uh, life as man, and through his acts merited to share with us. This grace that we receive is patterned after his image, and he wills to communicate it to us so that we may be conformed to him and in a certain sense reborn as Adam and Eve's daughters and sons in Christ, the new Adam. 
That is to say, Christ is a meritorious cause of our grace as the Savior who has reconciled us with God. He is in his human nature full of grace, an exemplary cause of grace, because all grace that we receive is measured by and similar to the perfection of grace that he as man possesses in plenitude. He is an instrumental cause as man, insofar as he wills intentionally in his human mind and heart that the members of his mystical body receive this grace. This life of grace in, in turn in us is Christ conforming. It moves our souls inwardly so that we become more like Christ in his human nature, despite the abyss of difference that exists between Jesus and us. Yes, Christ is sinless and has a plenitude of created grace in his human soul that is incomparably greater than that of any other human being, except perhaps in a qualified, qualified sense, his mother, the Virgin Mary. But it is this very grace of Christ that we receive a participation in from baptism, and it is his justice or righteousness that justifies us. We are made righteous in his original righteousness, and his life as, great, as the source of grace enlivens us in our living spiritual lives. The Father and Christ send the Holy Spirit upon us so that we can receive grace from them that is patterned after the formal exemplarity of the grace of Christ, and so that we can become like him and be incorporated into him mystically. Christ is a divine person who has a human nature full of grace. By grace, we do not become his person, the second person of the Trinity, but we participate in his personal life as the Son, as living members of his mystical body. And in doing so, we become adopted children of the Father and are moved inwardly by the Holy Spirit. Living in Christ means living in the Trinity. Living in the Trinity means living in Christ. So now I move to my third and final section of reflection, the contemplative horizon of all baptismal life. We are baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity for inhabitation by the Holy Trinity. Baptism sets us out on a course not only toward life in Christ in this world, but toward death in Christ. Aquinas asks the very pertinent question in the third part of the Summa, why the baptized do not live forever in the body, why they die, if indeed Christ has redeemed them from death and the consequences of sin. The answer he gives to this question is telling. The grace of Christ does not simply recreate anew the situation of Adam and the fallen human race to as, so as to set it back as to what it was before. Rather, God who respects human beings and permits them to sin in his respect for them, enters into the historical life and sphere of fallen human beings and is indeed himself killed by them in his human nature. In dying by righteousness and in rising from the dead in a recreated, glorified state in his human nature, God now makes the life of grace possible for human beings even in a world in which we still die. This life is available inwardly to the soul in this life and is available to the body, eschatologically, in the world to come, that is to be recreated from the dust of this world. So we still die, but now we die entirely differently, for now we can die in Christ, living physical death fruitfully in him as an act of love and surrender to God and as an act of love for neighbor, and we die physically unto life in the resurrection. His death has become an effective model for our death, and his resurrected life is a model for our eventual glorification, both in soul and in body. Baptism sets us out actively on the way into the eschatological death and life of Christ. We are not only baptized into his crucified righteousness and his death, but also into resurrection and life. His glory now lives in us, but it also makes claims above us, but it also makes claims upon us. 
just as we are called to serve him by our baptism in works of sanctification and righteousness, penance, and spiritual growth, so we are also called to enter into the drama of the cross in view of the mystery of resurrected life. We are called to allow Christ to live in us like a living tree of one who is crucified, who in his resurrected life lives and extends his life into us as so many branches and flowers and fruits into eternity, putting out vines into the vineyard of the church, prolonging his mystery of crucifixion and resurrection into the spiritual life of all the members of his mystical body. It is for this reason that the grace of baptism is inherently contemplative in orientation. Baptism opens the mind to the contemplative horizon of eternity, the life of the Trinity. Even in the simple darkness of faith, it is the eternal Father who awaits the soul, who asks it to come forward and pray. It is the eternal Word who enlightens the mind. It is the Holy Spirit who inflames the heart with simple hope and love, as the living flame of love within us, the Holy Spirit present at the core and center of our being. There was a famous debate in the early 20th century between Reginald Garrigou Lagrange on the one hand and Augustin Poulain on the other. The former argued that mysticism or the contemplative life is innate to the very seed of baptismal grace, and so a common calling for all human beings baptized in Christ, while the latter argued that mystical grace is reserved only to the few. Although it is clear that there are special elevations of grace, received, uh, reserved only to a few of the greatest saints. St. Thomas underscores that the human person, just because he or she is baptized, is given the immediate privilege of seeking spiritual intimacy with the divine. By faith, as I've noted, he says the intellect touches or has spiritual contact with the first truth God himself. And charity places the soul in this immediate proximity of spiritual friendship with God. Certainly, this intimacy with God can be lost or severely weakened by sin, and it can grow to innumerable degrees of higher perfection in those who seek God out more intentionally and habitually. But the seed of grace given in baptism to all is already intrinsically mystical. This is why the Church has come to affirm clearly at the Second Vatican Council the universal call to holiness present in baptism as such. We have noted then that the grace of baptism is inertial. It moves the soul by an inward tendency toward conformity to Christ in his inner life of grace and in his death and resurrection. It introduces the human person into the mystical body of the church and the sacramental economy. It inscribes into the soul an eschatological orientation towards eternal life and introduces the soul immediately into Trinitarian contemplation. However, if the grace of baptism is inertial and contemplative in orientation, this can also seem obscure to many or be entirely unrecognized. This is due to the fact that the inner life of contemplative faith can only be understood reflexively if it's manifest and taught by imitation in an exteriorized culture of grace. Only if a person sees the faith lived in body and soul by individuals and communities who manifest the contemplative life as an all-consuming human activity can they in turn understand themselves as contemplative beings. This is why human families, parish communities, and religious communities that meditate, contemplate, pray together collectively in recollected silence or liturgical prayer, all in differing degrees and in differing ways, teach Christian souls who they truly are and what they must become. Without a public culture of contemplative interiority manifest in an exteriority of common liturgical and um, contemplative life, the very root and the very ends of baptism becomes obscured and hidden from view. This is why in Catholic cultures where there exists a genuine fervor of faith and love, religious life flourishes, and in communities where religious life wanes, one can perceive a sign that the faith itself is becoming obscure to the general populace of the church. I move to a conclusion. 
Baptism contains a very deep paternal promise on the side of God that can easily be overlooked. Just in virtue of the fact that a soul is baptized, one can conclude that God has promised in seed to offer the grace of sanctification and Trinitarian indwelling to that person if they should cooperate integrally, integrally with God's design of grace. The grace in question is not static or merely fixed unchangingly in this life, but is something growing and dynamic within each person like a living water flowing up to the heavens, carrying the soul upward more progressively into the very temple of God as the book of Revelation depicts in its final two chapters. Therefore, just insofar as one is baptized, there is always the possibility not only of the reactualization of the grace of the sacrament through encounter with the living God, but also of progressive intensification of its effects. It makes sense in this light to promote the idea of contemplative and religious acts of gratitude for our Trinitarian baptism. Inwardly, the life in question, this life of transformation, is a life of Trinitarian inhabitation. Human beings should habitually thank God for the gift of baptism, of filial adoption into life in Christ, and they should ask God to intensify in them the effects of baptism so that they may come to know more deeply the mystery of God's paternity and the inward guidance of the Holy Spirit who dwells within the baptized. The desire to grow in living faith, hope, and charity, as well as the virtues, is something that we should pair naturally with a desire to be inwardly conformed to Christ. To live as a baptized contemplative Christian is to live in hope of the transformative power of the cross. Beloved, we are God's children now. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. As the first letter of St. John uh, uh, teaches us, the life of the Trinity in the human being is a wellspring of eternal life. It carries us forward into the aim of vision and union of the Holy Trinity, which is the resolution of all our desires. Thank you very much.